Hello everyone from Chelsea Fan TV. I hope you're all doing very well. Welcome back to another episode of Three Points Perspective. And uh, things are happening. Lots of things are happening and uh, nothing short of crazy. I mean, that's, that's probably the best way I could describe it. Um, usually international breaks are quite boring. There's not a lot going on. There's not many ideas. You know, if I wanted to make a video, I'd have to really dig deep and think, oh, what can I make a video about today? But there's just so many things. Um, so it's unfortunately not all on a football front, uh, but we're going to dig into it. Uh, we do have some some transfer news as well um, regarding Datro uh, Fofana. Um, and then obviously we're going to speak about the ownership and uh, the upcoming uh, game against Bournemouth as well. But how's it going, guys? Good to uh, good to see you both. Yeah, good, very good. Apart from the fact that it's cold, getting colder no, as we just been talking it's about. Getting, um, are you wearing? I'm not even wearing socks to be. Fair. I'm wearing a jumper. Quite cold. Yeah, no, it's pretty cold. I'm wearing a jumper. Got my warm coffee. Yeah, summer's over now, guys. This is the only show we ever record in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't mind, don't mind the mornings. The mornings are all right. But it's, it's, it's nice to have a normal football, or proper football back. Oh, this international stuff is, I'm sorry, it's, it's shit. It's so boring. Um, and <laughs> I, 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 it is. Out, outside, of, outside of a major tournament, I couldn't care less. I'd rather watch non-league football. It's like, honestly, it's... It's such a waste of time. And to have it so soon after the start of the season, it's just like it's just so unnecessary. So yeah, I mean I'm, I'm glad that it's uh it's back. Uh glad that no Chelsea players have picked up any injuries over the break. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to getting stuck back into the proper stuff. Have you uh did you watch England then? I no. watched a bit of the England Finland game yesterday. I, w- I watched that one. I didn't watch the Ireland game though. No, neither. I, 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 I just watched the goal. Just watch the goals and that's it. But we, we, I think we do play better. We are playing better football than under Southgate. But we obviously are. Group, but Charlie, group, Charlie, yeah. I mean, even though it's not Chelsea, like, do you not find it interesting just seeing how our players get on? Yeah, like when Nonny came it's on actually, yesterday, I was gripped. Yeah, no, I yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pleased to see, like, you know, the Chelsea guys doing well in that. But I'm not like, I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, God, I can't wait to watch England versus Finland today. I think it's interesting though as well because Gareth Southgate's gone, so I'm interested yeah, to see how he does. Yeah. If he does really well, he's probably going to end up getting yeah. a job. I, I wouldn't be adverse to him getting it. Wouldn't be adverse to him getting it. You know, it's nice to see new people getting an opportunity, sort of refreshing the squad and that. And uh, but yeah, uh, it's it's not for me. It's not he for strikes me. me as like a classic coach. I watched his interview after, and uh, they were like, "How's it been?" And he basically said, "Like, you know, it's been all right." But I'm like not very comfortable at all. I'm completely out of my comfort zone. It's, it's quite refreshing to see that though for a manager, because usually yeah. they just blag it, don't they? Whereas yeah. he just seems quite down to earth. And uh, from what I hear, he's just like a classic coach. He just wants to coach, and that's it. He even apparently on every Wednesday, um, he still runs a session in Coventry every single week on a Wednesday. Um, which has nothing to do with England whatsoever. It's just like a, a local training session. And even though he's got the England job, he's still doing it. So I, I just think he's quite a cool guy. I think he's like your classic football coach who just wants to enjoy doing what he's doing. Doesn't want to be involved in any of the other dramas like the national anthem and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not adverse to him getting the job if he can get results. No, I, I, I'll, I'll be on board of it. But um, yeah, I think there's a long way to go until that happens. Nina, do you think it's important to uh, sing the national anthem if you coach uh, an international team? I mean, isn't the whole thing is because he's like because of his nationality? To be fair, I didn't even really understand. To me, like I'm Bulgarian, I'll sing the Bulgarian national anthem. I'll sing the English national anthem. If I don't want to, I won't. I mean, it's it doesn't really bother me. Like, we've been at Wembley, haven't we, when we've sung the national anthem and we've had, like, Liverpool fans boo it and it's been a whole thing. But, you know, these things happen. Do, do what you want. I couldn't care. Yeah. You, don't, you don't care about it. I don't care. 
Like, do you really think this would be a conversation if Pep or Guardiola was, if, if, if Pep or Klopp was England manager and they didn't sing, <laughs> they didn't sing the anthem? But would, it, would it even be a conversation? No one would be saying anything about it. It's just it's hardly. Uh, it's so true, though, isn't it? It's so true. Who cares? It's like, if, if, you're, like, like, if you're going to do, if you're, if you're good, if you're good enough for the job, I don't care what you do. Sit down for the whole game. Don't sing. Do whatever you want to do. Just get the results on the pitch. It's just really not a big deal. Yeah, fair enough. Well, um, listen, let's let's uh, let's steer away from uh, England and international football. Let's let's move on to what the people came for, which is Chelsea FC. Um, listen, I mean, it's it's a fascinating uh, period at the moment. The Greek transfer window is either closed today or closing today. It closes uh, tonight. It closes tonight. Um, and uh, Datro Fafana is joining AEK Athens on loan with a 20 million option to buy. Now, personally, I think this is uh, good. I think this is good. We're shifting a player on who's not going to be playing for us. A lot of play, a lot of a lot of fans really like Fafana. We sure we saw him for a very short stint under uh, Graham Potter, and in that short stint, he actually played very well. Um, but Here's my my take on it. I actually watched uh, Mission to Burnley, which is a documentary uh, about when Vincent Company was there uh, in the Championship and then in the Premier League. And I, I to be honest with you, I, I've made my decision on Fafana just just from watching a small snippet of uh, that documentary. And I think that one of the reasons he hasn't been playing for Chelsea is because of his attitude. Just to give you guys a bit of context, I mean, have you watched the documentary? No, I've just seen no, the clip of company losing his mind at that geezer, whatever his I can't remember his name now, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Oh, what a training, is that mm. the one? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a really good documentary. I'd, I'd honestly... I mean, I but could, could we argue, though, mate, that realistically... Was that Trevor Farmer ever signed to actually properly play for Chelsea? Well, well he was, could say that about he anyone. Said that he? he'd be the next Drogba at Chelsea. No, but he played. He played. He played four appearances. I, I, for for me, it's it's one of them where when 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 Stanley was at Brighton, they were looking at Fafana to sign for Brighton. Then he comes to Chelsea, and they just carried the deal over. I I I, I for me, mate, I, I'm not convinced that he was signed. To be given an opportunity at Chelsea, you know, I think his footballing ability was more than capable of. Uh, but what are we basing yeah. it off, though? A few goals in Norway. No, I'm, I'm basing it off of what I saw when he played for Chelsea. I think we could see that. He, he did, yeah, he did okay. There was Chelsea a game against uh, game against Fulham. He started. I think it was Enzo Fernandez's debut. I think he started that game against Fulham, and he was subbed at half time. Thought he'd done all right. And then I think he done all right in one of the cup games where we got hammered at the at the Etihad, uh, whether it was FA Cup or League Cup, one of the ones where we were like four 0 down at half time or something under Potter. But he didn't really get an opportunity. I, I would have liked to have seen him get more of a chance, particularly considering we haven't signed the striker. You can't tell me he's worse than Mark Guillou. Surely he's not. No, not at all. Um, I think I think from what we've seen at Chelsea, I think he. He, he was more than capable of being part of our plans this season if we wanted him to, um, but that never seemed to be the case. Um, but yeah, I, I think, again, I think it's not all ability. I think some of it is attitude. This is just going on what I saw in the documentary. Um, it was basically, uh, Burnley lost a game and all the players clapped the fans and he just ran straight down the tunnel and it, it was well documented. And he was confronted by, I think it's Jack Cork, one of the Burnley players, one of the senior players. And like his reaction... It's all on camera. I thought it was pathetic. And I thought to myself, nah, man, I don't care. I know you don't play for Burnley. You're a Chelsea player. But that is horrendous. And I, I just, I wouldn't want that at Chelsea. Um, and seeing the blatant disrespect that he had for his teammates and the fans in that scenario, um, I just thought, nah. Because basically, Jack Court confronted him and was like, is everything okay? Because you've ran down the tunnel. And... <laughs> Fafana basically just went, yeah, man, I just went for a piss. And he was like, that's not that's not cool, man. You need to clap the fans. and Because it was the last game of the season as well. Give you oh, it was the last game of the season. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. You clap the fans on the last game of the season. But he just ran down, didn't have a care in the world. It was just, it was just blatant disrespect. And I personally don't want that at Chelsea. So for that reason and that reason alone... Um, I am not bothered about Fofana playing for Chelsea again. 
Um, I don't care if it was with Chelsea. If it can happen to Burnley, it can happen to us. As far as I'm concerned, a player's attitude doesn't change overnight. Um, for me, it's it's uh, a good decision to to move him on. I mean, how much did we actually sign for Farner for? What was the what was the fee that we was paid? It like eight nine million. I it was about eleven, maybe. I think like if if they if they buy if they if this twenty mil option to buy is activated, then I think we're going to make about eight or nine million. Oh, it was, it was eight to ten million pounds. So we're going to double our money if uh, Roughly, if this yeah. gets activated. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised that AK Athens would pay twenty million for him. But I mean, I twenty million he must, a lot of goals. Be, must be close to one of the biggest deals in the Greek league. I mean, I don't, I don't have great history yeah. of the Greek league, but I can't imagine they're big spenders. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, I, I, I presume it probably depend, uh, depends on obviously how he plays and where they finish in the uh, in the league if they qualify for European football, etc. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a good deal. I think uh, it's smart business. We've been criticising uh, the owners for a lot of things. There's been a massive split between the fan base. Um, we're going to get into that whole Todd Bowley versus Clear Lake Capital um, saga as well. I mean, do you think it's good business, Nina? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I've... am it's not a player that, you know, I've got some sort of connection with or some sort of affinity with where I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, it hurts to see him go. And to be fair, it's quite funny because you, I get that with a lot of players nowadays because we have so many, so many come in and go and so many are loaned in and loaned out. And it's, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of build affinity with players <clears throat> at Chelsea nowadays because times have changed so much. But I was quite open to the signing initially when he came because of the whole kind of narrative that came with it. You know, we're signing him. He's going to be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, someone that's going to solve our goal scoring uh, issues or whatever. But I think it's good business from us more than anything because I think that loan move to Burnley was pretty sensible. I think he, you know, he scored some good goals. It's obviously elevated his value further. And now we've been able to sell a play and make a profit on him. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy. I don't think that he would have really had a place ever at Chelsea, like Charlie said, purely because of the business we've then gone on to do since him. And I mean, you know, yeah, we've not really been shopping for number nines as such. But I think what we're looking for in terms of profile, I think he's not quite the physical kind of striker that you want in the Premier League at the moment, considering some of the defenders he'd be coming up against. I think it's more sensible for him to go off and, you know, he's going to get game time. They're not paying 20 million for a player that's going to sit on their bench all season. He's bring, being brought in to be a first teamer. So yeah, fair play for his career. That's probably the best move he could have got at the moment. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Let's move on to Todd Bowley and uh, Clear Lake Capital. This is a saga that, I mean, I could speak about forever, and I have. Um, for some reason, I've, I've I've never streamed in my life, but I've started streaming on the channel because there's just so much to talk about. Um, and we have two opposite sides of the coin. Um, you could argue they both want the same thing, which is to make money, but the way they believe they can make money and the way they believe it's <clears throat> the right way to, to, to manage a club is, is just very very different um we've got one side of the coin which is todd bowley and he is very much a believer in the hands-off approach so he wants a ceo of football and then a sporting director uh he wants them to make the decisions he don't doesn't want to be involved with uh you know the day-to-day -day. he doesn't believe that owners should be hands-on in that sense uh, and he wants stability with coaches as well. So Pochettino is an example. He didn't want Pochettino to leave Chelsea. Um, he would have happily given him another season. And, and he tried to uh, veto the decision or the, well, not the decision because it wasn't it's his decision to make at the end of the day as the owner. But he tried to, uh, for far, what was it, for far, um, when Stanley and Lawrence Stewart made an 18 or 19 uh, page report, and basically explain why they think Pochettino should be sacked. Todd Bowley said, scrap that. I want to keep him anyway. And then Ed Barley sacked him. And uh, that's kind of where some of the traction... They've all, got, they've, all got a sign, they've all got a sign off on it anyway, with like how the ownership works. Everyone's got a sign off. So Todd might not have wanted to get rid of Pochettino, but he still ultimately gave his sign off on it anyway. 
um, even though he probably didn't want to get rid of it. I think you've basically got to get a majority. So even if he said no, it was still going to be outvoted anyway by 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 the other people. I mean, the, the 18 page thing is mad, right? Because when Stanley and Stuart spoke about how they conducted some thorough and extensive process to appoint Pochettino, and then what? Nine months later, they've produced an 18 page document as to why their appointment they spent months doing has to go and was the wrong one. That, that, that makes them look like idiots as well. Like, how, how can you make it? How can you appoint someone, you know, spend two to three months doing it, and then you, you're producing an 18 page document as to why you made the wrong appointment and fucked up in your job? It's mad. Well, mm. it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's, uh, uh, well, you know how, how I felt. I mean, th- does this give you a different opinion on, on what's happened, Nina? Because I know that we were kind of in the same boat with Potch. Yeah, no, certainly. I think we've all known that, I think we all knew at the, at the time that Todd was in favour of Potch staying. And I think in terms of like learning curves, I think Todd has kind of grown in his journey since taking over Chelsea. And I think that he's made a lot of mistakes, you know. I mean, ownership as a whole has, right? We've always been the first to kind of look beyond, at least I have, to look at owners before I kind of look and scrutinise the manager. Because, you know, at the end of the day, managers inheriting everything that the owners are trying to kind of settle, really, the players that they're constantly bringing in, etc. And I think that ultimately they've always had the, the tougher job. And I don't think it's helped how in, um, unstable that kind of hierarchy has been at Chelsea but you know to go back to the point with Todd is that you know we've seen him in lights where he said things like oh we're going to thrash Real Madrid away 3-0 in the Champions League and you know he's come away from that he's learnt from it he's learnt to be a little bit less um, on the front with things but I think one thing he's always had is a desire to former relationship with the fans and just to be involved and, you know, be seen at football games with a Chelsea cap on, to be in attendance, um, you know, clap the fans, etc. Um, I think in terms of involvement, he's kind of been the face of it, but we've known that, you know, Egg Barley's the one kind of pulling the strings, essentially. So, as we've said, when it did come to that decision with um, kind of separating ways with Poch, then ultimately Todd was probably just um, pushed into that corner. So, yeah, I think in, in that side of things, that's probably where things have started to kind of fall apart. I think Poch probably knew, and at the time he was probably, what's the word, his relationship was deteriorating with ownership as well because theirs probably was right and it's own it only makes sense that you kind of fall out with people that have fallen out so I don't think this has been a case where they've fallen out during the transfer window I think this has been a case of this relationship falling apart throughout the year really you know you can stem back um but yeah it makes me sad because you know we're supposed to be rivaling with others and other fans and other ownerships and other clubs not with each other and I think this is just going to send us into more turmoil which is not what we need and ultimately it's not going to be long before Enzo Maresca starts having troubles with this thing as well because it will reach him as well and then the play is under him so it will have a little bit of a domino effect I think which I just hope it's worked out sooner than later but yeah it did kind of catch me by surprise why and it is so public now inevitably it is so public it's not something that's just been kind of worked out behind the scenes it's now kind of exploded everyone's talking about it everyone's pointing fingers going (laughs) look Chelsea have got problems again and it's just like can we have some stability where we just know what's happening obviously owners have been learning along the way but now it just seems like we're kind of back at square one where they've not been getting along they've not had the same ideas they've not been able to collaborate yes of course very different um, companies different investors different ideologies different businessmen but at the end of the day they've all they've all got shares in the club right they're ultimately all trying to paint a better future for Chelsea um but yeah it's just a bit of a mess isn't it well I don't think it's for me it's not a surprise I think that the big surprise is the extent to which the relationship is deteriorated I think it's been quite obvious for a while now that Bowley and Egg Barley don't particularly get on I mean right at the start Bowley was attending pretty much every game you'd see him at Stamford Bridge pretty much most weeks I know he was there for the first game of this season He's rarely there now. Um, he's not been in charge of recruitment since the January window of 2023. He's taken a backseat for well over a year now. And you can always tell someone's sort of knowledge of the situation if they sort of blame Bowley for everything. You know, for him, him being named the face of the consortium is probably the worst thing for him because he just gets blamed for everything, even though 
a lot of the stuff that's been going on recently is actually nothing to do with him. He's he's very much on the business side of things. Feliciano and uh, Iqbali driving driving the main footballing decisions. Um, so for me, the news wasn't a surprise that their relationship was was on the, was on the downward. So I think that's been quite common knowledge and quite obvious for a while now. But the big shock was how bad it really was, and the fact they're obviously now exploring different options. Now, look, it's not ideal. It's not what you want, but you need an ownership that are pulling in the same direction. So whatever the outcome ends up being, everyone's got to be on the same page, whoever it is and whatever the idea is. But look, I think whether it's Bowley or Eggball, I think a lot of people would prefer Bowley just because of one, you know, the effort he seemingly makes with the fans. I think he genuinely cares about the football club and actually wants to win. He's only got 13.5%, but that 13.5% is all his own money. Um, you know, Clear Lake are very much ma managing other people's money. So Bowley's got a, his own personal money in the football club. Uh, you know, and, and he's spoken about, you know, at various business conferences about preaching patience, about the importance of fans and whatnot. He's actually got an experience with sports clubs in terms of the Dodgers. And I know he's not a majority, he's only a minor owner there as well, but he's got that experience of, of building a sports team, which, you know, like Barley, Feliciano, these guys don't have that. Um, so... I would like it to be him, but we've got to be honest here. He's facing a very tricky task. He's got to buy out 61.5% majority shareholders. That's no easy task. Now, you, do, you believe that, do you believe that this can, uh, you know, potentially be a case of, if uh, we know Bowley's going to make an offer, apparently it's 2.5 billion, which would double um, Clear Lake's uh, initial investment. Um, but what, what I'm wondering is, does does he have to buy 100% of Clear Lake shares? Can he get away with buying 50% of Clear Lake shares? No, so know. they I still have a stake so. in the club, and he is then now the majority shareholder. I don't think so. I think it's going to be one or it's going to be one or the other. Like basically, one of these guys is not going to be involved in Chelsea anymore. Like there's no way, in my view, that this gets. That they make up and they just carry on as it is. Like someone's being bought out, so Bowley's going to be made the majority majority shareholder, and Egbali and Co will be gone, or it's the other way around. Th those are the only two solutions that are that are on the table right now. And you know, Bowley's one is definitely from what reports are saying. Bowley's idea and way of doing things is definitely seemingly on paper much much better than what Egbali's looking to do. Owners should be in the background. We saw it with Roman. The guy was just in the background, you know. He just let people get on with their jobs. That's what you've got to do. I think Egg Barley, to me, strikes me as someone that micromanages everything and clearly doesn't trust the people that he's employed to do their jobs. If he constantly needs to have all the decisions run past him, he seemingly can't let these guys get on with what they've been brought in to do. So maybe he's a bit of a control freak. Maybe he's got, you know, some sort of trust issues with the people he's employed. I don't know, but this guy, like, seems to micromanage everything just needs to chill out just let let these people do what they need to do um and you just sort of you don't get a good feel i don't say you don't get a good feeling about him but whenever you see him at the ground or whenever you see him arriving or leaving or whatever he's got that sort of aura about him where so you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to bump into him like down some sort of alley or something he's like a he's like an intimidating guy um he looks like the mafia he does look like the mafia, but he, he's never he's never spoken openly communicated with the fans. It's always been Bowley that's the one that's speaking, whether it's at business conferences. Yes, I know they do like some program notes in the final program of the season, but you know the only time we've ever heard clearly speak about Chelsea was when Feliciano spoke a while ago, and he just spoke about making money or whatever it was. I can't remember his exact quotes, but it, it, it didn't go down he, particularly he, what well. What he said, Charlie, was uh, he said it, it's great having success on the pitch. But he basically said it's better to have a sustainable business model. And he yeah. criticised our model, saying yeah. that that could improve. He believed that that could improve, you know, which is ridiculous in, in, in the sense that how can you criticise the most successful club in England? I mean, I, I find that very, very difficult to, I mean, if that's your model, that's what made Chelsea worth two point two and a half billion in the first place, which is why, why you paid a quote unquote um, inflated price. Uh, I think, so, sorry, say that. That I think money someone... is not going to go up if you're not winning trophies. No, in terms of, well, it probably will go up because they're going to drive revenues. But um, it's it's harder, in my opinion, to increase the value of your club if you're not successful. 
I agree. I was just going to say that I think this has probably been something that's been waiting to happen. Um, there's a massive report in depth thing from the Athletic, I think, on Monday. Um, and basically, as we know, you know, ideally this this takeover would have been done over a much longer period of time, but we obviously had to rush it through for reasons that everyone knows. Um, like these guys have done had done deals with each other before, but this consortium had never worked in business together before this. And I just think this is potentially a byproduct of having to hastily put together a consortium of people um, in order to, to, to beat the deadline without really knowing if it's going to work. Because these guys have never worked together on a business capacity, in a business capacity before. They've, As I said, they've done the odd deals with, between each other here and there. But in terms of actually, you know, working together in a proper business, they've never done it before. So I think there was always going to be a risk of something like this happening. Um, and, you know, it's a shame that it's come to this on such a big scale where, I mean, ideally, you would have had much more time to, 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 to for the takeover to go through, more time to sort of get the consortium together that you think is is the right one. This has all been very rushed through. And ultimately, yes, a lot's happened since then. But I think it all stems back to the takeover being rushed through in the first place, which is why we kind of find ourselves in this situation where we are now. Mm. Yeah. Where do you stand on this, Nina? Yeah, I mean, we've always had our doubts, haven't we, that we've we've been sceptical about can these people that are now running our club actually run it? Because, yes, they're good businessmen, but like they've never run a football club before. Mind you, one as big as Chelsea. So it has always had, you know, question marks surrounding it, but we've not really had a choice but just to kind of let it be, right? And we've seen and we've talked about the mistakes made on the way, absolutely. But, you know, I just think... I, I worry because I'm now looking at our next games. I'm looking at Maresca's press conferences. All the questions and everything that is going to be directed at him will be about ownership, ultimately. And he's just been waiting for the transfer window to close so he can kind of gather who, which players are staying, which players are going to be in his Premier League team this weekend, which will be in his Conference League ne uh, team next week. And it's just going to be owners, owners, owners. And he's not even going to be able to digest everything. He's going to be dealing with all of that and we've seen that Maresca is quite a honest person he's quite a, a direct manager some might view him as snappy but you know he's been very honest about loads of things and it's just like it'll be a matter of time where he gets angry about all of this getting asked about this when he's trying to focus on his players when he's trying to focus on his team and we're going to be in the headlines again because at some point down the line he's going to say something right he's going to say something and it, this is just going to continue we're going to be talked about we're going to be you know in the headlines constantly for the wrong reasons and I just think that it's going to affect the players at some point as well most of them have just arrived are looking to settle down and they've kind of come into this civil war that has just kind of gone up into the air so that's my concern because you know they're all businessmen they're meant to be able to work these things out but they can't really agree to disagree at the moment it seems but yeah I'm just looking purely on the footballing side of things we've waited so long for things to stabilize since the takeover and they just seem to be hitting kind of new bumps in the road and I just worry about our player I worry about players I worry about our manager I worry about how this will yeah just affect everyone else moving forward I mean it's all like fun and games what they're sort of doing amongst themselves and who's going to do what and who's going to find a new investor to buy who out but yeah it's just more turmoil like we can't have a quiet day can we season ends potch has gone transfer window ends ownership's up in the air like like it's just always something and it's like well what is next because we are the hottest topic and other clubs are just getting on with it you don't see you know Arsenal and City and Yale Man United are equally perhaps talking points throughout the year but they're just getting on with it and it just seems like with us there's something new every week. I mean which which side of the fence are you on Nina? I mean are you leaning more towards Clear Lake or, or Bowley? I'd say Bowley because again, Bowley's giving me more reason to trust that he's got Chelsea's best interests at heart. You know, Egg Barley's, like we've said, not shied away from the fact that he's business orientated, that he's trying to sort this 
new business model out to you know make him money make it a successful run business which yeah at the end of the day I get it that football and clubs owning a club is business but at the end of the day you know we're really trying to focus on rebuilding this new kind of ideology and structure at the club that focuses on players and success and winning trophies sustainably challenging for the title in the future so yeah I'd say Bowley because I mean you know we've spoken to him haven't we Alex your best friends of Todd's you know we We've got a uh, a special relationship, but like you talk about egg barley, like my mum, she doesn't come to that many games anymore, but like she comes to games and she sees him because obviously they're set up in Westview. Whenever egg barley's been down below, she sees him and she's like, he is such a blank canvas. You know, there's no emotion. You can't tell what this guy's thinking. You can't tell how this guy's feeling. For all you know, he's not even interested in, in the football. He's just there. He's present. He's thinking about his business. And it just kind of really is true. And we're all humans. At the end of the day, we do look for emotion. We like to think that these that, that these owners have our club's best interest at heart. And at the moment, Todd Bowley's selling it more. So if he's going to go and he's going to be determined to buy out, um, you know, Clear Lake and Egg Barley, then so be it. If that's your, you know, that's the cards you want to play and you actually want Chelsea's kind of future to look better and more sustainable on the footballing pitch then great of course he wants to make money we know that we're not silly but he's always said that you know Chelsea is um something that he wants to see successful in the future so at the moment it's hard not to stick with that side of it is it yeah I mean it's interesting because although there's obviously things that both both uh, disagree on there's there's things that Bowley and Clear Lake agree on as well um, you know they agree with the data-led approach the multi-club model and the youth-led approach but it's just that Bowley would make well, more, would make more for yeah for uh, and you, older and players you, yeah and you notice when he was like in his interim sporting director role so I know maybe they weren't going to happen but you know there were strong links to Ronaldo at the time there were strong links with Neymar as well um, even though there was links with Mbappe, I don't know how true those ones are, but definitely Ronaldo and Neymar. You know, uh, Bowley would un undoubtedly make more exceptions. And I think he's more prepared to do what it takes to put a winning team together. I think he knows that maybe you can't be successful doing things the way we're doing and a few exceptions need to be made. Whereas Egg Barley seems to very much tunnel vision down, down, this, way of, down this way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to also speak about something that um people have also said and i want to address this notion that even though Bowley has experience managing or owning um different teams the lakers and uh the dodgers as well he has minority stakes um i just want to say that first of all Bowley actually has a lot of power at the dodgers um even though he's a minority shareholder um I think he is the one who drives forward that project. And I think it's very similar to what we thought was going to happen uh, with Chelsea. Obviously, that's playing out ever so uh, differently now. Now, um, this notion that even though he's part of the Dodgers, they haven't been successful. It is total bullshit. Total bullshit. Now, I, I personally, I actually like baseball. I don't know why. I like it. Um, and I actually follow the Dodgers ever since Bowley took over. I was like, you know, what, that's going to be my team. And over the past couple of years, I've genuinely been interested in watching it. And um, I've learned a bit about baseball along the way as well. So here's the first thing. Um, they've won one World Series uh, since Todd Bowley's taken over. It's been just over 10 years, I would say. Bowley's been uh, involved with the Dodgers. So in 10 years, roughly... One World Series. One, one league title, basically. One World Series, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. How many teams do you th are there in Major League Baseball? 30. Okay. So it's actually 50% harder to win in baseball than it is to win the Premier League. You've got to compete with an extra 10 teams, right? Also, unlike in England with the Premier League, where you've got one team dominating it all, baseball, it just, it's not like that at all. Every it's year, a different team wins, mate. Every single year. If you go over the last 10 years, right, you've got Giants, Royals, Cubs, Astros, Red Sox, Nationals, Dodgers, Braves, Astros, Rangers, right? Nine teams in 10 years won the World Series, okay? So it's not like the same teams winning all the time. This constantly changes, okay? Now, 
The Dodgers won one World Series. They got to two finals. They've also arguably got the best squad in baseball at this moment of time. And they do have the best player in baseball. With Shohei, oh, Shohei Shohei yeah. So what does that tell you? That tells you since Bowley took over, the Dodgers have been more successful, right? Because they've won seven World Series in their whole history. Okay, and three of those finals have been under under Bowley and, and that consortium. And they have they have got the best team in, in baseball at the moment. There's only one team uh, that has a better record so far this season. And they are the favourites to win the World Series. I think it will happen. So this tells me that even though, yes, you could argue, OK, they haven't won every single year or even half of the time, but they are constantly up there competing and they have improved since he's come in. And this was a long term project because we're looking at over 10 years now. Right. Um, I think that it would be quite similar at Chelsea and that we would be pushing to compete with Bowley. Nobody can ever guarantee trophies. I think it's very difficult to say that. But I, I think we would be up there pushing to win. Right. Whether you actually win or not, again, you leave that to the players and the management. Um, but with with Egg Barley and Clear Lake, it seems like the approach is very much. It's minimal. It's mediocre. Get Champions League football. You're happy with that. It's what Tottenham did for years under Poch. A little bit like Arsenal, Arsenal did under yeah. Wenger when they had the new stadium. And I think that that is the approach that Clear Lake want. Get the pound notes. Uh, increase like the value of their money, doesn't it? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. That's, 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 as I said, that's what the whole issue with, with uh, Arsenal in the, in the final Wenger years were, was that the ownership were just happy to come forth because that that made that made them money and anything else was a bonus there you go um and 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 this is where i think that that's the real split and we, we you spoke about it earlier charlie you know Bowley says we want to win egg barley and Feliciano say we want to run a sustainable business pick your sides people pick your sides um, but I mean, there are positives to Egg Barley. I mean, I do think that Bowley certainly made mistakes. Um, but then I would argue that Egg Barley would have made similar mistakes um, if he would have been in the same position. And if it wasn't because he was over ambitious, it would have been because he wasn't ambitious enough. Uh, there's both sides to this. And uh, I don't think people actually uh, understand that if Bowley was in Egg Barley's shoes now, he would have had to rectify a whole load of different mistakes. And it just happens to be that, you know, Bowley was the first one and Egg Barley's come and it looks like he's cleaning up shop, uh, which makes him seem sensible and a good businessman. But who knows what he would have done if he'd come in, right? They pledged over 1.5 billion anyway uh, in terms of, of spending money on the club. But that money was going to have to be spent somewhere. Uh, it's just that we did it all very quickly. And um, we've sort of shot ourselves in the foot. But I, I do believe that, you know, Todd Bowley would still have a similar approach in signing big names. But now he can consult professionals who actually know what they're talking about. And uh, <laughs> in fact, I say that he doesn't want to be involved in the decisions at all. He wants the football people to do what they do best. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an absolutely fascinating scenario. I also don't think that we know enough. Right. Because. And we, we are won. only hearing a couple days worth mm -hmm. of articles, a couple days worth of stories. In the next coming months, there'll be many, many more things. Uh, you know, according to what I've read, Bowley wants to get this resolved within two months. So that yes, means quick, he will make not, an not offer. Not a quick fix. Not a quick yeah. fix. Yeah, yeah he will, he'll make an offer and he wants that to be finalised um, by just before Christmas. Which is which is quite quick, in considering how long we know takeovers uh, are. But I, I suppose because he's already involved in the club, it would be a little bit more simple uh, if there was a willingness to sell on uh, on Clear Lake's side. Um, but yeah, it's it's just frustrating. I mean, let us know in the comments, guys. I mean, who do you want? Uh, I know the majority of Chelsea fans are leaning towards Bowley, but there is also that side. Of people that that quite like what Igbali's doing because it is a sensible approach, but then you've got to find the fine line between what's sensible, and then you've got to fit ambition into that as well. Yep, <laughs> word. 
yeah ambition it's not a word we hear much these days but there you go um but yeah i mean i i don't know i really don't know i think um you know there's another thing that came out uh from ben jacobs saying that clear lake sources suggest Bowley was too swayed by individual agents and signed off on deals uh, that made limited business sense yeah, pointing to the need to loan sterling to arsenal on deadline day this summer just to get less than half of his wages off the books as proof that the initial Bowley led window in charge has left lingering problems. So I think we're almost going to see we, this we know, we know PR war of uh, stories coming out from both sides. I mean, we, we know that when that first window was crap and then and mistakes were made, but you know, of course there was going, of course that was going to be the, I don't think that should be a surprise. And that certain people certainly shouldn't be judging Bowley's capabilities based off that first window. It, it's just such a narrow minded way of approaching things yeah of course there was mistakes in that first window and it was crap and contracts were given to players that that shouldn't have been given to them but you know he was just literally straight in the job having to make relationships he's doing all these deals himself you know he was sort of the new guy in town a lot of money of course people were going to take advantage and of course deals were going to be offered that would never be offered now but that shouldn't be used against Bowley and you know people shouldn't be judging his credentials based off that window yeah i mean let, let me ask you this nina um so they offered two and a half billion let's say Bolio offered clear like that is that a is that a, a price that you think should be accepted i mean that it's is double your money isn't it return yeah. um oh is it is that, no it might be 100%. is it double isn't it double money? the initial yeah. amount it might be yeah, double. yeah you're right it's 100 100 percent of their money, uh, money back, yeah. plus, plus a profit as well I mean, is that is that a good offer or do you think it's going to take more cash? It's a good offer, but I don't think it's one that would be accepted because I don't think that's what they want, right? I think they want to stay. Like, that's the thing that both are very adamant that they want to stay put at Chelsea. It's not a case of, oh, okay, well, I'll agree to whatever, right? So I even think that 100% return isn't something that they would be interested in because they see this as something they can make money from in the long run right they see this as being potentially something that could make double double what could be offered now in you know years to come and I think that's the whole point is that you know both are very adamant that they can make money that they've got this you know kind of running well or could have it running well eventually to a point where why would they back down why would they walk away with whatever you know, the other offers, you know, if Todd offers whatever he does. So I think that's the whole point here, that they both want to stay, both want to be operating Chelsea without the other, potentially, if this is what we are getting at now that, you know, they are not agreeing with each other anymore, that they can't continue to run it kind of side by side as one. And that's the thing, isn't it? Because if they both want to uh, buy each other out, then that makes me think that it's not a case of, I'll go if you if you offer more. Really, that's the impression I get. Yeah. Um, I just think it's... I, I, I don't think they'll accept it either. And no. if you look at the value that uh, Chelsea Chelsea's value, it's increased by half a billion since yeah. it was bought. Um, so we're actually worth about three billion at the moment. And that's because of the increased value of just being a part of the Premier League and the TV money. Uh, on top of the fact that the Club World Cup is uh, now a thing. And that's going to ger generate tremendous uh, revenue for all clubs that are taking part. Um, and and that's th those are some of the factors as to why um, we are slightly more valuable. Obviously, if we get into the Champions League, that will increase again. Um, so I actually think, and this is playing, you know, devil's advocate, if Bowley is really desperate to take the lead and he's willing to wait out as well and be patient, and be ambitious, because I think you will have to offer more money than what we're speaking about. I almost think that in terms of getting Bowley involved as a 100%, uh, well, the, the majority shareholder, I almost think Chelsea's, if we're not successful, and if we don't get Champions League and European football, I think that plays into Bowley, because he can wait, right? This is his money clearly have investors to please and if they see that they're not going to get a return on their investment and they have a, a get out clause which will be um Bowley, and that's the only option they're going to have for at least eight seven seven eight years then uh, i think that's something they would consider 
because if if we continue to lackluster behind in not just English football but European football as well, then they're not going to get the return they're looking for. And I think it's going to look a lot more attractive um, looking inside and saying, you know what, we can get out here and still make our money because we've seen it before. Football clubs, if the ownership doesn't go right, it can go in so many different directions. Um, I'm not saying that Chelsea are going to go under or anything like that, but I am saying that if we continue to fall behind, well, we've we've seen already that it's it's very difficult to uh, to get back up, and uh, it's a lot easier when you're at the top of the mountain to stay there because you're making money, you have good players, you can sell those players for more, and and therefore buy better players, and people want to come into your academy. If you're not a good team, that just doesn't happen. And uh, it starts to get to the stage where you think you're unlucky, but actually this has been building up for a long time. Um, so I, I hope it doesn't happen. But I think that, you know, if 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 there's one realistic way of, of Bowley actually coming in, it's because of the quote-unquote downfall of Chelsea. And uh, that will give him a gateway to actually have offers that clearly will listen to. Uh, being that they're not actually getting anywhere financially regardless. Um, but, yeah, let's move on to uh, Bournemouth. We've got a preview. Uh, well, we've got a few preview shows that are going to be coming up anyway. Um, so we'll just touch on it. But, I mean, I, I think that this is going to be quite a tough away day, guys. Um, it's always tough. Bournemouth is is actually, surprisingly, if you look at their points on the board, I mean, they've got, what, five points? More than uh, us. Yeah, well, they do. But they've 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 played some really good stuff, and they should have beat Newcastle. I mean, they had that stupid handball, um, which was uh, never a handball, and um, they've had yeah. a massive fighting spirit. They, they had that mad comeback against Everton before the break. They're like yes. two nil, they like three, three goals in like five yeah, minutes. They two nil that they were losing two nil with five minutes left, and they won. That's unbelievable, Charlie. Do you know what that reminds me of? That's like United last season when we won 4 3. Those yeah. moments in football, you, I don't oh, care what process. you say, yeah. it is more valuable than winning a trophy to me because I will never forget. I cried, mate. I cried <laughs> when Cole Palmer scored that goal. It was mad. It, it was unbelievable. Obviously, you want to win bad. trophies, but there's oh, moments yeah. in football that you can't recreate ever again. And it's just once in a lifetime. And I believe that it was one of those days for us. Like, Bourne, Bournemouth's tough, though, mate. Obviously, last season was a shit nil-nil. Uh, and then... The was season... that the one at home? No, no away. Oh. Uh, the one, two, one at home. And then, and, the, and then the season before, mate, was... Uh, was the only game we won under... Well, only game we won under Lampard in his return spell. Where everyone was just fucking loving it. And then I can't, I can't remember... I can't remember much past him. But, mate, I don't think we've got a very good record there. No, I mean, we that, don't. Lampard, that Lampard win must be the one of the only wins there in the last few years. I mean, I can't remember the last time we won at Bournemouth um, other than that one. I mean, I, I, I mean, it could be wrong. It could we be beat a lot. Bournemouth when it was Conte's second season, I think Hazard scored a goal, but it wasn't pretty. Apart from that, we have struggled. Um, I, I, I think we're really going to have a tough one. I think we're going to have yeah, a tough I one. I think there's going to be goals, lots of goals. And I, I said this pretty much every week, actually. Um, you need to win this game and score th three or more goals to get three points, in my opinion. Um, because Bournemouth, not only have they shown that they can score goals, they've shown they can score goals late and still come back with uh, points on the board. And we've shown this season that we can score goals, but we can't keep the ball out of our net. And that worries me. But... Uh, we did see good signs against Crystal Palace of the partnership of Levi Colwell and um, Fafana as well. Uh, you know, starting to get a little bit of chemistry. We've obviously got Kukurea in there, who I think is uh, a solid player. I don't think that there's any need to worry about him. And then you've got Malo Gusto uh, as well on the right-hand side, although there might be an injury problem with Malagusto, am I right in saying that? Yeah, or... he's not he obviously picked up that thigh injury against Palace and then uh, he's he's, he's a, not he, serious though, is it? But I don't think he'll play. He's he's not he's not been like in any of the training photos they've released like this week. I don't think he's been in, been in any of them. So 
Mm -hmm. um, we're on Wednesday now. If he's not pictured today, then I think we can forget him starting this game. There's a small chance. Maybe, the right. Well, we're fucked because Reese James hasn't even returned to training. So, and apparently his injury wasn't serious. And apparently, no, it's, injury yeah, it's, serious. This, is, this is the thing that pisses me off. And then, like, they just chat bollocks about this. We stuff. don't get like, clarity on injuries anymore. Like, Reese was a, was a, it was banned for the first three games anyway. So, it was kind of irrelevant. So that's what that's why I said at the time when that minor hamstring setback came out, I was like, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go overboard on it because he's bound for the first three games anyway. But if he's not fit to play against Bournemouth, then I'm gonna have more of a problem with it. And we're now what a couple of days, two, three days out from Bournemouth, not mm -hmm. been pitching and training at all. Uh, there was a report the, like maybe last week that he he was still a couple of weeks away from returning to full training, and I was like. What is this bullshit that we're being told that oh it was a minor issue and whatnot? And it's the same with Lavia as well. Lavia missed the Wolves game. Oh, just a minor problem. He missed Palace as well. And he's not even back in training at all for this Bournemouth game. So so what, what's going on here? Like is, mm. is Chelsea's definition of minor, like instead of five months, it's free. Is is, is that is that what we're going off? Like I don't I don't understand it, but like we're just being fed bollocks about the, the, the extent of, of of people's injuries, and it's and it's really frustrating because two minor injuries supposedly, you know, and then suddenly they what Lavia's going to have missed three games probably, and 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 Reece is fucking you know when's he going to play? It's, it's really do, annoying. Who do we play on the right? Well, it'll be, it'll, well, it'll I be, think we play Caicedo. It'll be it'll, it literally be it'll be Caicedo or the Sassy. He, he he does suit the role of inverting. I mean, I, I'm he does, quite but then the Sassy here. makes more sense though, doesn't he? Because he's played there before. I mean, Caicedo's played right back before for Brighton, but but I not mean, for look, Chelsea like the no. Sassy has. It'd be, it'd be, nah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be... play the Sassy there. Yeah. I mean, if you played the Sassy on the right, you've got a player you're going to have to hold, can't push up. And you're going to have to invert Kukurea instead. If uh, if you've got um, Caicedo, I, mean, I, I have no work. issue with him on the right because he can literally come into midfield. Yeah, he hasn't played his best football under uh, Enzo Maresca. Maybe this is actually a, a, a position that will suit him. I mean, we don't know. Um, you know, so I'm, might I'm be... intrigued to see if it works or a um, bit of a curveball. He might play, he could play Josh Akinpong, the youngster, but. I think that's a little bit of a, a long shot considering he's not really featured very much at all. Is he a right back? I thought he was a centre back. No, no, he's a right back, I think. Oh, okay. I mean, he, he did come on for a couple of, he came on in pre season. Um, I don't think he looked too bad, if I'm honest, but you can't really judge much from pre season. It's a big, it's a big arse, though, to just chuck him in from the off in a game like this. Yeah. At Bournemouth away as well. I, I, I suspect he'll go to Sassy, particularly if Lavia is unavailable. You're going to need Kaiseido in that midfield, so I, I think he'll go with the Sassy. Do you think? Um, do you think Jalen Sancho will play? Um, yeah, I think he'll play. He won't start. I think he'll, he'll be in the play. squad, though, won't he? Yeah, he'll be in the squad, but mate, we've, we've got problems. Like you know, the right back situation's not going to be ideal. Obviously, midfield, Lavia still missing, not ideal. That's um, okay so, though, because we've got loads of wingers. They can just kind be, of be spread around on the pitch. This is going to be a tough game. No, make yeah. no. No, no, no doubt about it, mate. This is going to be a really tricky game for us. I mean, I've not, I've not looked at Bournemouth too much this season. I've seen a few of their results, but in terms of actually watching them, not really seeing an awful lot of them. Obviously, they lost Solanke. They replaced him with Ivan Lisson, that that the guy from Porto. Very well. I was not yeah. I think he's, he's done okay. Obviously, Kepler's there now. Uh, I don't think he'll be playing. <laughs> well, I, I don't think Chelsea would have, rubbish, I man. I love I the downfall um, of Kepler. No, I don't think I the loan terms. It. I'm pretty sure the loan terms won't allow him to play against us. Um, but yeah, I mate, want Kepler to play against it's, us. It's, it's a I tough want one, him mate. To play. It's, it's a tough place to go as well, isn't it? It's a tough place to go. You know, small ground. Um, you know, it, it, it's difficult. So I'll be honest, mate. It feels mad saying it. It's. I'd almost be a little. I'd almost be surprised if we won. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I think it's, all, it's not a win's going to be difficult, Charlie. It's really not. Um, well, of course, it's not. We have a, a a relatively poor record against Bournemouth um, in terms of getting wins on the board. I mean, we've drawn a couple of games and we've lost. We've we've had some really heavy losses actually. I, well, I think we got I think we got smashed four 0 there one year. Was it under Sari? Yeah, that was when Sari was was manager. Yeah, we got battered four 0 Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's and... be positive, guys, because I thought we'd go to the Molyneux, okay, and get <laughs> demolished. And instead, we demolished. So who knows? Well, it's, possible, it's definitely possible, but it's going to be a really tough one. You know, Saturday night, 8 p.m. Why is it at 8 p.m. on a Saturday? I don't know, you always get fucked over the shit kickoffs. Yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, 8 p.m. on a Saturday. I mean, we're driving down, to be fair, but I, I, I feel for any Chelsea fans that are getting the train down because Mate, no, we know is, uh, I think it's like a 20 odd minute walk. Yeah, the train station is, is the 20 train station is far. It's quite far from the ground. Yeah, it's probably, well, it might even be a half hour walk. Um, I remember two years ago when I, I don't know if you come in the car with us, Charlie, but uh, my mate Steve, he drove down and then. We ended up getting people in the car just to drop them off at the station. So we walked to the car. Oh, man, I, I always, I always drive, mate, to Bournemouth. I always come home and then just drive. So it's only forty minutes. Are you driving? In, well, from from not from London though. Where are you? I thought you didn't have a car. No, I've just borrowed mum's my mum's car. Oh, fair yeah. enough. Fair yeah, enough. I don't have a car. No. Oh, fair play to you though. Fair play. I, honestly, I think it's mate, the right it's, my, it's, it's my local, mate. It, it's not far. How far is it for you? An hour? Forty minutes. Yeah, I mean, um, now me and Rachel were driving down. We're going down. I've only got two tickets for that one, um, so I, I was hoping to see if I could get some more. It's but actually, one. isn't that one of the toughest to get away tickets? Well, the smallest one, isn't it? No, Luton's the worst, mate. Because Luton is the only game where if you're a season t away season ticket holder, you don't get guaranteed tickets. It's the only one. Um, so what they do at Luton is they do a raffle, but you have to manually enter the raffle. And if you don't, then you miss sure. out completely. Yeah. So that's why I couldn't get tickets last season. Um, whereas Bournemouth, if you're an away season ticket holder, uh, you can still get priority access for a percentage of those tickets. And then obviously everything else is is based on points. But I think you needed, what, over 140 points or something to yeah, get tickets for Bournemouth. I mean, I have maybe 70 or 80. Um, so that was never going to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm excited for it. I think we've we've certainly got work to do. I mean, Nina, how, how do you see that game playing out? You, you say we've got to be positive. Um, how do we approach this game? Positively. <laughs> But no, let me first plug, guys, make sure you tune in to the Watch Along on Saturday, which I'll be hosting, because I won't be going to the stadium, but I will be bringing you first, first-hand raw reaction, so make sure you tune into that. But I think, I think we need to, yeah, approach this positively, purely because I think, look, our home record last season, and well, previous seasons, has always been one we've worried about, right? But we've also gone away and struggled. So I think that now we can take a little bit of inspiration from the Molyneux away win, which ended up being, you know, one of the best. I mean, when have we ever won there, really, let alone 6-2? So mm. I think we can take some pride of the fact that, you know, we can slowly sort that reputation out a little bit if I'm completely honest probably the fearful Chelsea fan in me would say we probably go there and get a draw and perhaps some will walk away and think well with where we are right now I think a lot of fans are losing a little bit of patience with the whole it's a new manager working with new players we need to go there get three points but I think we still need to consider it is a tough away day you know Bournemouth have I think they've got Liverpool after us as well. So they've got, you know, a couple of tough fixtures one after the other. So they'll be looking to get, uh, you know, any points they can. I still do worry about our defence. And I think that's one thing I, I still worry about. I think that's where we could get exposed. But I'm hoping that we can just finish our chances um, and hopefully get a narrow win. Because I think that's what it will be if we do well, With a clean sheet? No chance. With a clean sheet. I'd, I'd go for a 2-1 if you what, found it, or a 1-1. I would scrappy love one a 1-0. Scrappy 1-0, scrappy I'll take it. Shit, a shit little tap-in, and we just backs to the wall job. Uh, Jackson at the back post, take I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I want a 1-0 with happens. an own goal. That's doesn't matter how that happens. but I don't care how we do it. No, but do you know what? I actually don't think we've played badly in any of our games this season. But having said that, mate, if we don't win this game, even if it's a draw or whatever... Like one one win in your first four games, you then go to West Ham away afterwards, where again we haven't got a particularly good record. One win in four could easily become one in five, and then if you if you're looking at a one in five to start the season, 
it doesn't matter how well you've played. Right. You can't dress it up as anything other than complete shit. So, like, you know, we, we've got, it doesn't, we can all say, oh, we've played quite well. We've got to start winning games. You know, you can't afford to go to go into West Ham next week with one win in four. You just can't. But this is the new Chelsea, according to... Well, we, should be, we should be celebrating one win in five, potentially. I'm just yeah. quoting Enzo, man. Yeah. That's all I'm doing. I know it's the reality right now, but the fact that we feel nervous about games against Bournemouth and West Ham sort of shows where we are. But it's, it's true, mate. You know, one, like we, we all criticise the Pochettino start to the season, three wins in 10. I know we're not quite there yet, but, you know, you could that, that could very easily be repeated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, let, let us know in the comments what you guys think. Do you think that... Um, we're going to be able to pull out a result against Bournemouth. If so, what will that result be? Um, and uh, just what's your take on the whole situation at Chelsea? For Fana obviously going out, is that good business? And uh, are you team Bowley or team Clear Lake um, with regards to the Civil War ownership battle at Chelsea? Uh, let us know. Subscribe to Nina and Charlie as well. Their channels will be in the description. And uh, if you haven't already checked out FOCO, they are the partners, the sponsors of the channel. You can use the code CFTV15 for a 15% discount off of any FOCO gear. Um, there's a link in the description for that as well. But all the best, guys, and we will catch up very, very soon.